welcome to our senior readings. Thank you for coming. Tonight we have Gabby Watford and Alan Lee. And tomorrow night we'll have Delaney Burke and Callista Panati. Same place, same time. This reading is part of the culmination of a senior creative writer's time here. In addition to giving this reading, they also read a list of 15 to 20 books over the course of the year on top of their regular coursework. They write a college level senior thesis based on that reading and they produce a portfolio of publishable work. Gabby and Alan are both two year seniors who have been quite explosive during their time here. They've done a lot with those two years. They both produced a ton of work and they've challenged themselves by exploring new genres, revising more deeply, writing challenging points of view, experimenting with new concrete and invented poetry forms, and working with other languages in poetry, experimenting with humor and horror, writing very short works, writing very long works, and even writing Russian literature-inspired philosophical works. So you'll get to hear and see some of their most successful explorations tonight. Um, in a wide range of work they have to present to you. Please welcome our first reader, Gabby. Hello. Um, the, if you look at our, um, the thing you hand out before an event. <laughs> Thank you, program. Um, you'll see that the first piece I'm going to present tonight is a play. Um, and so this is a play I wrote um, during uh, first semester, fall semester, playwriting class. We do this every year. We do um, the creative writing labs um, with the theater department, and we collab and we presented those in, the, in December. So you might recognize those um, if you went to those showings um, and if you don't then uh, it's brand new for you and um, so I'd like to welcome my readers up to the stage. This play is titled A Hairy Situation. Play opens with Harry and Harry's girlfriend sitting on a park bench. It's such a beautiful day, isn't it? Oh yes, the trees, the birds, the way the sun sits just right behind those clouds. Turns to look at her. But you know, I think there's something even more beautiful than all that. Oh Harry, you're such a romantic. Harry rests his head on her shoulder. As he snuggles, he breathes in a little. Gosh, you smell really good. Well, I switch shampoos. No, but really. Harry takes a deeper breath and brings a piece of hair closer to his nose. Like, really good. Harry's girlfriend turns away from him, serious. Listen, Harry, you're a really great guy, but I think we need to talk. I don't want to talk. I just want to breathe you in, just want to feel that hair. Harry scoots closer and brings a piece of hair to his face. Really, I just feel like we're moving too fast. Harry suddenly bites down on her hair and tries to eat it. She shrieks and stands up. What are you doing? Oh, God, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. I just look at that hair and... Harry, who licks his lips, takes a step forward. Is this a joke, Harry? Tell me you're joking. Harry lunges for her hair, and she scrambles away from him. Don't call me. Don't text me. We're over. Harry's girlfriend runs off stage. What's going on? Why did I do that? I've never done something like... A woman enters, and when Harry spots her, he crouches behind the bench. Carefully, as she doesn't see him, the woman has a pair of beautifully done French braids. When she sits on the bench, Harry stands, staring at the hair a while before giving in and grabbing the braids. He rips it off, and the woman screams and runs off stage. Harry sits down and begins to eat the braid as if it was a piece of French bread. Blackout. When the lights return, we see Harry sitting on the bench alone. A couple of days have passed. His hair is significantly longer. Under the bench, we can see a sleeping bag and a suitcase. A man with a man bun walks in. Again, Harry hides behind the bench and waits until the man is comfortable. Harry pulls out a pair of scissors from the suitcase and then slowly and cautiously cuts the man bun from the man's head. 
Man doesn't notice. But Avian sees Harry reemerge. His hair is again much longer. It hangs in front of his eyes and covers most of his face. He is also taller. Blackout. When lights go up, Harry is lying asleep on the bench. He hears voices approaching and wakes. His legs have gotten so long that when he tries to get up, it is rather difficult. He stands himself up just as two police people enter the park. Harry tries to hide behind the bench, but he's so tall he sticks out. His torso also looks as though it is covered in hair. Police person one talks to police person two. Now, uh, we've been getting some complaints about some homeless guy harassing civilians, so we're just going to go in and tell him if he continues, we'll have to take him into custody for public disturbance. What's he been doing exactly? Yelling? Throwing rocks at cars? People keep saying he's been... Looks at papers. Trying to eat people's hair? <laughs> Excuse me? I'm sure it's just that he's been trying to smell people or something. Probably some kind of drug. Holy mother, what is that? Police person two points at Harry, and policeman one gasps as he sees him. Harry charges at the two and begins munching on police person one's afro. The two of them scream and are frozen in terror. Blackout. Lights come back onto Harry standing alone in the park. The bench is gone. He is several feet taller than any human, and he looks like an elongated version of Cousin It. So, so hungry. Ever since they blocked off the trail and shut down the park, I've seen nobody. Nobody wants to come near me. Only one guy and an egg has more hair than he did. Oh, I'm so, so hungry. In walks Cardi with a giant French Revolution slash beehive wig. Under the wig, her natural hair color has been dyed some unnatural color. She's dressed in several mismatching costume pieces. Oh. My. God. Harry sneaks up behind Cardi. With one easy snatch, Harry grabs the wig with his teeth and tries to chew it. Disgusted, he spits it out. That's not real hair. Cardi turns and looks at him. She seems completely unfazed. Well, yeah, duh. Harry looks at Cardi for a while, expecting her to run away, screaming. Well, aren't you going to run away? Tell the police about me or something? Even just scream? Mm, nah. You, you going to hurt me? Get revenge or something like that? Maybe kill me and use me to stuff your mattress. Is, is that it? No, no, dude. I, nothing like that. I don't think I could hurt you if I wanted to. I might appreciate an apology for throwing my wig on the ground, though. Oh, yeah. Harry tries to pick up the wig, but he can't because his lines are too long. Carrie, Cardi ends up picking up and handing it to him. Sorry for doing that to your fake hair. That was rude. Harry offers the wig back to Cardi. She accepts. That's okay. I forgive you. Cardi makes as though she's about to leave, but turns back and looks at Harry interestedly. You know, I've been wandering through these woods for forever. Do you mind if I sit down? Not, not at all. As she's about to sit. Do you want to sit down too? Can, can you sit down? Is that possible for you? Not without falling over. And even then, it's just that much harder to get back up. Well, what if I help you? Here, take my hand. Harry gingerly takes Cardi's hand, and she helps him maneuver down so he sits on the ground with his legs splayed out in front of him. Cardi sits down, too. I guess I can trust you to help me back up later? Yes, of course. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm Harry, by the way. Uh, that's my name. I'm Cardi. Nice to meet you. How come you're not afraid of me? You're not reacting like anybody else. Well... Not too long ago, I got diagnosed with a heart condition. My doctor says that I really could die at any moment, anywhere. It's really changed how I've chosen to live my life. She motions to her clothes as an example. Wow, that's really powerful. Thank you. It doesn't always feel like what I'm choosing is right, though. When I spend time inside with my family, I feel like I'm missing out on the world, and when I spend time outside, well, I feel like I'm missing out on my family. It's just like, no matter what you do, it's never enough. Yes, exactly. It's like even when you do the right thing, it feels wrong. I know exactly how you feel. Really? Well, before all this... Harry motions to his overly hairy and elongated body. I tried, I tried to love, had some good friends, and an incredible girlfriend, but no matter what she give me, I still 
I still wanted more. I couldn't have enough. Harry, what do you mean? I wanted love. Why was there never enough love? Sorry, it doesn't really matter now, does it? No one loves me. No one would ever want to be friends with a monster like me. Well, it, it's only human to want love. And you know, I'll be your friend, Harry. Really? Cardi holds Harry's hand comfortingly. Yes, of course we'll be friends. But just friends, okay? Harry lets out a sob in happiness. Oh, Harry, it'll be all right. Cardi pats his head, strokes his hair. You'll see, everything's going to turn out all right. I think you're actually really interesting. I can really see us getting along. I, I think I even could love you. <gasps> you know, platonically. Harry holds out his arms for a hug again, and Cardi gives in good humoredly. Excitedly, she pulls away, and she stands as if she's about to show Harry something. But as she takes a step away, she suddenly clutches at her chest. Oh, God! Cardi dies. <laughs> And Harry sits in shock, looking at her. Eventually, Harry scoots over and picks up Cardi's head and places it on his lap. He strokes her hair a while before giving his last line. Oh, I hate when they dye their hair. Harry makes a lunge at the hair with his mouth as it blacks out and the play ends. <laughs> the end. Thank you all my readers. My next piece is a piece of flash fiction, and it's titled, Would You Like to Get Slurpees After School? Ice blue, she comes to school. Hair too, whole outfit made from white fur. If we kissed, would our lips freeze? Stuck together like a kid's tongue in a tetherball pole. She sits in homeroom. The teacher cranks the thermostat and blames it on a broken window. When she gets called on to read page 26, I can see her breath. Clouds slipping past her words and hanging in the atmosphere. The bell rings as she walks down that marble hallway. I hear the crunch of snow under her boots. I sit behind her in second period. Her hair ends in points, ends in icicles. I want to reach out and run my hands through them, hear wind chimes, watch her hair get glossy from the heat of my hand with the melting ice. Third period we don't share. I spend it staring out the window. I spend it meditating on body heat. I spend it wondering if the common cold is an airborne illness. I have a short poem called Burial at Sea. If I kneel on the flooded church tiles, Will I cave the floor, fall right through the ocean to rapture? I have another flash fiction piece, but this time it's true. It's called Your Toast. You, or rather your family, does not have a toaster. You have a toaster oven. Many times you have stuck a fork into the oven to pull out a tortilla or a Pop-Tart or several, several, several pieces of toast. You are visiting your older brother. He has a new apartment. He has a toaster. In the morning, you wake up early. You are hungry for toast. You toss two pieces in, wait for the Hollywood magic of them springing out of the toaster. To your disappointment, they do not. You try to stick your fingers in, it burns. You grab a fork, position it about the toaster, ready to lower the fork in to retrieve your toast when you pause. Metro's 2012's Dumb Ways to Die <laughs> begins playing in your head. You remember an animated pink blob, stick a fork into a toaster, hold it above their head, and disintegrate. You pause, put the fork down, and pick up a knife. This is also true, but a little bit longer. It's called The Yurt. 2011, Christmas Day. We drive into Vernal, Utah, right about noon. 
just as we planned and just in time for lunch. This is before we could use GPSs for everything, so my sister and I straighten up in our car seats, ready to play find a restaurant. We find several, but they all keep having these signs on the doors that read, sorry, we're closed. After restaurant number three, we realize <laughs> it's Sunday in Utah. How silly of us. Of course, everything is closed. Well, that means the chains are at least open. I spot a Domino's and a McDonald's, but we're not that desperate yet. But weirdly, those are closed too. That's when we realize it's also Christmas Day. After half our drive around town, we find an all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet. I'm excited for tacos and sushi and mac and cheese and all in one meal. While stuffing ourselves on bread rolls and generously helping ourselves to the ice cream bar, my sister and I watch everyone else in the restaurant. Two other families are sitting on the opposite side of the room, quiet, staring solemnly into their bowls. I almost want to remind them it's Christmas. To make sure we have enough time for our hike, we eat quickly and begin searching for the trailhead. The plan is to hike up to the yurt and spend a couple nights. According to the website, the hike takes about two or three hours on cross-country skis. We are walking, trailing sleds, and therefore calculate our hike will take a little bit longer. However, we also calculated finding the trailhead immediately after lunch. The trailhead, however, did not agree with those plans, and we burned an hour driving back and forth trying to locate it. Though a little frustrating, we do find it. The sun is still high, and our spirits higher, and thus, we set off. I think it really is a rather adventurous endeavor. The path starts smooth, padded down, and apparent. We pass several other hikers, but turning down the path, smiling and warm. As we continue hiking up, however, the path begins looking less and less recognizable. Eventually, we are trudging through untouched snow, falling only the depression over the snow isn't quite as deep. I think this is so Beautiful, passing trees and trees draped in innocent snow, peaceful snow. I can see the crystals, the tiny, perfect water molecules that connect each snowflake together. Hills and hills of this magical snow. I stop and look, mountains posed so well, catching the light just right. I have to do a double take to make sure these aren't cardboard cutouts. My sister, seven at the time, slows down every so often and tries to crawl into one of the sleds we are pulling behind us. Already heavy with our clothes, sleeping bags, food, and other camping gear, we keep shaking her off, saying we can only stop and rest when anyone gets tired. After hour three of hiking, I start expecting us to arrive at the yurt at any moment. I begin envisioning it behind every hill and beneath every... and behind... <laughs> Behind every tree I see up ahead. I keep thinking, we only have 20 more steps and then we're there. Hour four is long, and my parents are no longer so patient with us wanting to stop every five feet or so to rest. Looking back, I can imagine their eyes were watching the sun, feeling uneasy about it sinking dangerously low. We have no idea where this yurt is. We have never done anything like this before. I'm not really thinking about the sun or our experience. I'm daydreaming about the walnuts in my backpack and about changing my wet socks. And then it gets dark. And then it starts to snow. And unlike movies might have you believe, everyone who has ever gone to watch the sun rise or set knows the sun takes forever to move. It's not a flip of a light switch. Still, the events that were probably drawn out for an hour or more in real life happen with gradually increasing concern and appropriate decision making all happen in a matter of seconds in my memory. A. We abandon our sleeping bags, camping gear, sled. B. My mother takes off in front of us, trying to locate the yurt. C. My sister says she cannot walk anymore. D. We abandon our food sled. E. My father carries my sister on his shoulders. I hike behind him, holding onto my backpack stripes, straps like a lifeline. F. It's pitch black, and it only snows harder. 
At this point, you might assume I'm thinking we are going to die. Ultimate peril. That I fear my father will fall over in the snow and I will have to carry my sister all through the night back to civilization and never see my mother again. But no, I don't assume that. I'm not afraid. There is some hopelessness felt, something akin to believing that we might just be caught in a time void, left to trudge through never-ending snow in the dark for the rest of our lives, but that doesn't really bother me. I just want to change out of my wet socks. Looking back, perhaps I should have been more afraid. It was possible we had taken a wrong turn in the dark, lost on National Forest Parkland. What ranger was going to stumble upon us tomorrow morning the day after Christmas. My sister had started to shake badly. Our sleds could have been buried under feet of snow, never to be found, bears, an avalanche. Our destination was 8,900 feet up in elevation, frostbite, hypothermia, pneumonia. Not likely, but possible. No, I'm not afraid. Just my stupid, stinky, Wet sock that keeps riding down my foot, soon to just be a bundle of wet mush compressed against my toes. This is what I'm most concerned about. But before we can all freeze to death, my mom comes back. She has found the yurt, and with people in it. With her leading the way, we arrive at the Limberton Flags Yurt, 20 feet in diameter, and with a couple already sitting in it stoking a fire. They offer us hot chocolate, move their things to make room for us, and add a few logs to the fire. I think they're perhaps saints, or our guardian angels who have come down to help us. In retrospect, we had booked the yurt and paid to stay, and the lock had been torn off the door, so the line between squatters and guardian angels runs thin, apparently. Perhaps a good thing because the combination the park service had given us doesn't work anyways. Our clothes are soaked. With all our sleds abandoned out in the snow, none of us have a change of clothes or anything to eat. Well, not all of us. The feeling of pride I feel as I open my backpack, the only one to have carried food or dry clothes all the way to the yurt is almost ego fueling. I feel like a mix of Mother Teresa and God as I lend my sweatpants to my sister and food to my parents. Whenever I feel useless in my family unit, I remember that time I saved everyone from a couple hours of mild uncomfortability before the next morning when my mom and dad went back down to retrieve the sleds. I changed shyly, turning back to the wall because of the strangers, but I'm also unalarmed by their presence. They speak in soft voices, and my parents make small talk. I go to bed so quickly and so deeply, I'm not even awake when they leave the next morning. I'm not even sure where in the yurt they slept. After my parents come back from retrieving the sleds, they mention little messages left by our stuff, things like, bears, keep away, and don't take this, it's not yours. Presumably written in the snow either by the bears or the couple. My parents laugh over breakfast. There weren't any footprints when we come up. How long have they been up here? It sure is nice. Should we tell the Forest Service they did walk it or attempt to? I'm glad they were here though. It really helped us. We spend the rest of the day sledding and playing cards and throwing more wood into the wood stove. We stay another night and leave the next day. The hike down is nothing but joy. Having learned our lesson, we leave early in the morning. We reload the sleds, leaving enough room for my sister and I to go down the hike in one of the sleds. The slopes are steep, and we go so far and so fast, we leave our parents completely out of sight behind us. They don't think that's too funny. So um, for the end um, pieces, I have a couple of concrete poems that I've been uh, that I created in my tutorial, um, and because um, all but one is concrete, and but the last still needs images, so we wanted to project those up on the screen for you. The 
those look good? Okay. So this first one is called A Little Light and a Poem to Match. Left without blowing it out, came back, whole house was burnt down, powerful, what a little circle of wax and a wick can do to you. Strike phosphorus and a little bit of glass powder, some wood, and then it's just like you, burning out fast. This is called attachment to the linguam fernum, for little, for little. <laughs> I want to split it, lick it. Does it taste like anything? Yours can do this roll thing, calling it genetics in a way mine can't. Yours can touch the tip of your nose, the bottom of your chin. I think mine has ag agoraphobia, but yet I still drool while I sleep. I saw a guy once with a gauge on his cheek, and I thought it was like a window, you know, to let some light in. Must be awful lonely being the strongest muscle in your body, or is that fiction? Should I hold it, coat it in silver, give it to the cat? Is it doing laps while I'm running my mouth? What exactly makes it so French? Is it French to want to share? I just want to know what bones feel like. <clears throat> Pardon me? <laughs> no! Did it go away? Is it back? It's back. Okay. This is elephants mourn their dead. Cobalt blue, my first pet bit me. I was five. Six, too strong. Seven, tried to drown itself. At eight, I held a baby, Indian macaw, wrapped in a cool green Peruvian blanket, and watched it die. This left me screaming, its little monkey face too close to my own, smashed up in a mirror. We tried puppies after that, turtles, goldfish. A mean grandmother cat lasted in our house a while, three years before she tore up some catnip in the yard. Gave the jackrabbits away to a preschool when I was 12. I live with just humans now. That isn't awful. I draw pictures of elephants on sticky notes and take them to coconuts. Close my eyes and pet my wild beast of a friend. <coughs> and um, for my last piece tonight, I have um, this poem titled I looked to Ikea for solemn advice, but unfortunately, don't speak Swedish. This is a, a set of translation poems. This is what you'll need. You're screwed. Time to get the hammer. <laughs> what you'll never have. Reading is confusing, don't. Reading leads to ideas, don't. And most importantly, do not question what is in the box. <laughs> Make phone calls to fill the empty void that is your heart cavity and will feed your pathetic craving to hear someone's voice. <laughs> this is what you seek. <coughs> I should have brought water with me. Material things matter to us, to you. When a corner of your dresser becomes fractured, it is a deeper reflection of your mental state and how you are crumbling at the edges. Get a rug. <laughs> what you cannot keep. You are weak and unable to carry a single board. It's barely your own height. Let Walter from next door take it. He has hair. He is a man. He deserves it more than you do. And that's everything. Thank you guys so much. I'd like to welcome Ellen Lee to the stage, our second reader. kind of thought we had to print out our own things and like give them to people, so in order to better, you know, 
better distinguish who, uh, whose pieces were whose. I thought I had to put my face in front of it. So, <laughs> comes, a little, comes a little quote that I, I like reading myself when I go to sleep at night, which is from the great Sis King of its era, Spy Kids 2, Island of Lost Dreams. <laughs> and which Steve Buscemi, uh, Bus Bus whatever his name is, playing as Dr. Romeo, says in a movie that probably shouldn't deserve this line, do you think God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he's created? Apparently he created this. <laughs> I, I did not take into account how short you are. I didn't have a platform. Maybe I'm just in the town hall. That's a charity. Okay. So this first piece is called Soldier's Arm. It's in Korean, so you don't know what it means. But uh, if I were to translate it for you, it roughly translates to uh, soldier life. And soldier is a type of drink that's kind of like vodka. If vodka is to Russians, then soju is for Koreans. So get drunk on this a lot. I, I don't. Big issues. Um, my hate does not come in colorful juice boxes wrapped in little packs of six and sold for two forty nine tops at your local mom and pop shop. No, it comes in ceramic jars, not swaying and churning in Super Bowl beer kegs opened up a week post-production for family get-togethers and the occasional frat party. It stays down in an unmarked, dimly lit cellar, maturing, evaporating, oxidizing, fermenting, a stench overpowering, seeping into every orifice and yet crystal clear in appearance. Ancient Korean aging technique passed down for generations is as follows. One part regret, two parts in externally induced suffering, five tablespoons of safe self-hatred and a pinch of the agonizing urge for revenge. My parents told me never to crack open the stuff in front of poor Westerners. Their taste buds aren't used to this other, and so it'll sit in the back of my straw roof hut away from sight and mind. Han ain't what it used to be now that all this sediment sentiment is gone, but the gasoline taste remains, and it stings. Why, oh why does it sting like fucking hell? Please make it stop. Perhaps I, too, will come home one day, intoxicated by tonics, ready to take my own life, and in some painfully ironic manner, I would have realized too late that in brewing this heat within me, my corpse would have become sickly sweetened by it. That was really depressing. There's another problem. Hopefully it's not. No, I thought this is depressing too. Okay. Don't worry, the good ones come later. This one's called How to Unshrink Your Sweater, and I thought of it after I got mad at my brother for shrinking his own sweater. I don't know why I do that. I'm such a terrible human being. Um, <laughs> don't panic. It's not that big of a deal. It happens all the time. It happens all the time with you. You do this all the time. It just had to be you, didn't it? Sure. Take your time. Sit there looking dumbfounded as you attempt to distinguish figures in the clouds. Ignore the pending messages sitting on your dashboard as you try to shove lead the wrong way in a mechanical pencil. When it snaps, find a witty way to make it relate to your current mental state and never bring it up again. Bite your fingernails, fiddle with your fingers, bounce your legs, do everything in your power to look as inconspicuous as possible. Swear out loud, preferably in a different language because you don't want people to understand why you're so mad. Tear up the whole freaking place, kick down a chair, rip out your hair, yell at your parents, not because they're responsible in any way, but because you don't want to carry that with yourself. Wonder if shrunken sweaters are of more value to society than you are because at the end of the day, these people would want to still use them. Okay, that was a little too rough. Uh, oh no, this one's rough too. Uh, so this one's called this one's called Airborne after in Kaylin's poetry class, uh, I found out that on the day that I was born, January 11th, was the day of death of Louis Nixon III, which if you've watched the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers, which I'm assuming none of you have, um, <laughs> is, is this alcoholic dude attached to the 101st Airborne Division, and he, he's my spirit animal because he just gets sad, but he's also kind of sarcastic, and I like him. <laughs> we sunk 
like rocks in a wet sea of clouds, plummeting deep into dark, murky depths until we couldn't even find ourselves, vision clouded, senses numbed. I just wanted something pure, no more watered down shit, only the best for mama's baby boy, the best kind for the worst boy. A little farm boy, Harvard graduate, shredded beatly over a steel record salad, a gun sight makes for a good equalizer. Silhouette in both character and form. The first thing they told me when I landed was congratulations, you're getting promoted. And they handed me a medal, a fucking medal. Zero plus one equals one. Daniels plus Mikey plus Smith plus Pat plus Jackie plus Perez plus Lewis plus Hopper plus Parker equals zero. You can't trade in medals for lives. Okay, let's, let's get some good ones up here. Let's get some happy ones. Stop being depressing. Okay. So I wrote a couple of poems that were meant to be just, you know, short, enjoyable, you know, bite-sized ones, appetizers. I should have put them first, because that's what appetizers are, but apparently I forgot that. Um, so this one's called Poem About Trying to Write Haikus. The beauty is in the words, of which there are none on this paper. A pair of freshmen begin discussing the finer points of Takeshi's six dance products. Hard contact between silver and ceramic warms the approach of the mouth breathers. Miss Watson's face spills coffee with her stupid looking donut mug. A tree outside sways in the afternoon breeze. The guy across from me looks kind of cute. That's it. All right, this one is another fun one called uh, House Party Crasher Dignity Smasher. This was supposed to be my introduction to the rap game, but I couldn't rap, so. <laughs> <clears throat> Childish Gambino's red bone, but it's heard from inside a bathroom because your crush says you're a bus kill and you don't want to cry in front of your crew, so you try and ignore the two kids hooking up loudly in the room next door as you struggle to text to a friend, this party blows, want to get out of here? Stifling tears of absolute defeat, you stupid, stupid nerd. <laughs> this one's called Yes Ma and Home Wait. In place of snow falls tears. Over lo-fi music are screams. Initiation came afoot. Huddling around our phones, clad in jerseys and school merch, not all of this is gonna make it. A taxi stops outside the bar. The driver grumbles at the sight of, yes, more drunk high schoolers. Come step outside. Can't you smell that air? Drink it in like booze. I just realized I have a lot of pieces that are either cider or about alcohol. I'm sorry about that. I should have chosen better pieces that are more appropriate, but judging by the looks of things, I don't think there's too many kids, so I can, I just want before, I can swear to that. <laughs> you can't stop me, can you? Do what I want. <laughs> um, so this is an excerpt from uh, this novel that I've been trying to work on repeatedly and then failing, but then coming back to it. It's called In the Fields of Revolution. And basically, I grew up with uh, Ken Burns, which is this cool documentary historian dude who makes a lot of um, documentaries about uh, wars. And I was like, that's super cool, except what if like it was fictional? And all the, all the perspectives that you heard about it were all from fictional people describing the fictional conflict. That way I can't describe anything real, and there's no harm. So um, this one comes from the perspective, this is sort of flashback from this main character, who later on she's kind of pivotal, but I don't have to explain it right now. The most vivid of her dreams began with a rainy day over a dilapidated cottage, covered with dated sigils and worn-out propaganda banners that indicated the place as an enemy stronghold. Selected out of a group of equally perturbed comrades, she would re reluctantly step out of the back of that cramped truck and land onto muddy soil, uh, soil, wading through at least 20 feet of destroyed farmland before reaching the cottage in question. She readied her some machine gun, wiping off dirt and grime over its exposed injection port when she was done with this task. 
She plunged into the abyss, darting from room to room, bursting through wooden doors and into dusty rooms filled with scattered household objects, a sink here, a table there, some closet or shelf in the back. She would scan the room with urgency. A particularly tall floor lamp might resemble an enemy in the dark, and a sense of panic would overwhelm her for a few milliseconds before, before she could gay regain her composure. Eyeing the one door she had yet to check, she approached it and placed her hands on the handle, forgetting to kick it down like she had been taught it to. She turned to the handle and nudged the door open. The absence of any light forcing her to squint into the unexplored room. It was something akin to what she had once read about deep sea exploration. Dark, silent, unpredictable, and absolutely terrifying. Then she saw the glint of something metallic out of the corner of her eye. Military condition took over. By the time the smoke cleared, she'd emptied an entire magazine into that room. A figure slumped on the floor, groaning as the voice trailed off. Blood seeped out underneath the body, a red tide eventually covering the clutched pistol. It was, it was a boy, no younger than nine. I need to stop writing depressing pieces. I need to stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Okay, this one's a little lighter. Um, so this one's called The Experiment. And let me open it with a quote from Caroline Forche that reads, there is nothing one man will not do to another. The receptionist peeked over her computer screen, catching a glimpse of the crowd that eagerly awaited an announcement in the stuffy lobby room. Looking off of her computer, she stood up and read off a list of rejected testers at rapid fire speed. Those who hadn't been selected for the experiment almost simultaneously groaned and slowly made for the exit. Only seven remained once the list was finished, and it seemed as though the scientists had found a random enough group to work with. They had apparently selected a lanky ethics professor, a very average-looking office worker, two mothers who just so happened to know each other through P PTA meetings, a 10-year-old girl who looked particularly lost, an old man in a wheelchair, and a philosophy postgrad who looked awfully dead inside. Or at least that was what the reporters nudging him for questions thought of him. The other subjects were much more willing to reciprocate, or were perhaps starving for some kind of attention because they spent the next few, several minutes answering inconsequential questions like, where'd you graduate, or how important are you, or do you know Kanye West, before the receptionist had to drag the, two, uh, the seven subjects into the room forcefully. The seven were then shoved into what had to be the brightest lab room they had ever voluntarily stepped into. Two researchers stood near a table discussing something in hushed voices. A PA system was installed with accompanying speakers along with cameras stationed at all four, four corners of the room, which was relaying a video feed back to an excited crowd of reporters and journalists clamoring just outside the low walls of the lab room. The receptionist, grumbling something about not being paid enough for this, shut the entrance of the testing room, the sound of which prompted the two researchers to retract from their also engaging discussion and to turn their attention to the testers. I assume you've all been briefed on the importance of this experiment, asked one of the researchers. After all, you've all been volunteered to participate in what might be the greatest ethics experiment this world would ever see. The professor, the ethics professor, sensing an opportunity to expound upon her infinite wisdom, interrupted the researcher and began her own version of that spe same speech. Yes, in fact, never in history have we ever, and I mean ever, gone ahead and done something this amazing. So, so amazing, some might even call this stupid. But we are not stupid. I am not stupid. This, th the, this is the first step towards actually answering the theoretical. For years, we've assumed that human behavior, and as the speech turned into a tirade against her detractors in her university, the office worker timidly stepped up to the researcher, who had unfortunately prompted this impromptu speech and asked, I hate to say this, but are those cameras up there broadcasting to TV? Um, yeah, why, why do you? Once again, the researcher was interrupted by yet another rowdy test subject, and this time it would be the office worker seemingly breaking out of his dimness, and upon running up to one of the cameras mounted on the ceiling, began furiously shouting random names, perhaps his friends or loved ones, and take took up various athletic poses akin to the scene on WWE. 
The rest of the subjects didn't seem to be particularly orderly either. The mothers had begun gossiping about one of the teachers that ran the school their children apparently went to. The little girl made it, had made it her lifetime occupation to run around and touch various testing equipment strewn across, across the room. The old man was aging in his wheelchair, <laughs> and the postgrad had collapsed on the floor, snoring just as loud as a passing train. So sensing all this enthusiasm in the room, the researcher promptly turned to her co-worker and asked him to bring the test materials out. She then read off a list of boring pre precautions and legal details, though she was continuously interrupted by the ethics professor's attempts to explain the intricacies and the moral boundaries they were about to be face facing. Luckily, the co-worker hurried back into the room carrying the test materials, giving the researcher an excuse to stop reading off of the list and to back off. The co-worker placed on what he had brought from the adjacent room, which was two objects, a small black container the size of a shoebox, and a live baby. Too much to everyone's confusion. The two researchers, once finished with their preparations, promptly left the room and locked the door behind them. After a few minutes, the female researcher's voice then came through the affirmation PA system. The experiment will begin now. So before interacting with any of the objects on this table, I would like to begin with the first phase of the experiment by explaining how exactly it works. Our experiment deals with an ethical dilemma conducted live on television. Please open the box. Sitting in the container was a massive revolver. That thing in there is loaded with six bullets. In order to leave the, uh, leave the room with the reward money of $10,000, one of you must either kill the six other testers in the room with you or shoot the baby. During the testing period, the room's gonna be sealed shut and there's absolutely no way you can actually leave the room without forfeiting the experiment. Good luck. The room, which had been filled with nonstop talking for the last five minutes, had now become dead silent. Even the professor had seemingly stumped, uh, producing a notepad from her pocket and nervously scrawling an incoherent mess before crumpling up whatever she had written and looked up from her work. Did, did I hear that right? Asked the professor. Who you know? The human? She was, she was joking, right? The office alert the worker lowered. The other test subjects, save for the postgrad, who had just woken up, looked amongst one another. For a minute, it seemed as though nobody had inhabited that room, and then, oh my god, we're all gonna die! I can't shoot a baby! I just can't, who came up with this sick shit? This is illegal! Why weren't we told about this? We were, but apparently someone didn't listen! I just wanted the prize money! The freaking prize money! I didn't want to shoot no baby! And you, you're basically saying that you want to shoot all of us like some maniac? You just said you weren't gonna shoot the baby! I would! If our lives depended on it, but that was on paper. You were just bragging about how you were gonna do anything it takes. You know, maybe, just maybe, this is an experiment to see. If we don't decide to do it, like, maybe they want us to be humane, or humane my ass! I need that price money for Vegas! Sensing that no conclusion would then be reached, the postcard remembered everything he had learned in college and sighed, took the revolver, shot the baby on the spot. <laughs> Everybody else looked in the shock, eyes wide open, and mouths agape. Expecting a reprisal, postgrad spoke first. What? He shrugged. He's still dead. Or, this last one's all right, and this one's a bit of a throwback. Um, so you know that, you know? I promise I wasn't going to be positive. <laughs> no, no, so this last part, um, sensing that this is probably the last time I ever read anything in front of a live audience or do so willingly or do so comfortably, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to read the first piece that I read in front of a group that I actually felt like I liked. So if you were here for a while, you might have heard this before. This one's called Childhood Adventures, The Conquest of Racing of Love. And I have must remind all of you, this is a nonfiction. This is, no, not a nonfiction. It's fiction. None of this is real. None of this is real. Please don't bother me about this. I totally don't go to sleep at night or fail to do so thinking about this every night. Um, 
to which do you go? TMI, TMI, Ellen, TMI. So, in fifth grade, I started to go to one fancy boarding school in Connecticut. And because I was basically the only Asian school uh, kid in that state, I was, well, made up of about 96% white people, my arrival would cue the start of the where do you come from line of Jack Bauer interrogations that I've gotten used to by now. I lost all my old friends when I moved over from Korea to the States. Again, not me. Uh, so I needed some new people to hang out with, and I was fine with being the subject of several borderline racist questions about whether I ate dogs or if I was Kim Jong-un's cousin. And hell, that kind of made me feel like a celebrity, because at the time, you know, with all the jokes, um, this kind of ended up shaping how crude my humor would get. Um, but none of y'all are here to hear about me because I'm boring, so you're here, to, you're here to hear about how I fail, so that's, let's get back to what really matters. So I'm not going to give any real names, because again, none of this is real, <laughs> not real, but, so I'm just going to pretend this girl's name is Samantha. She was pretty cool to me in fifth grade, you know, we both like video games, which yes I know, you want to shout nerd, but please stop making fun of me for now, it's important in the story because yes, we were both nerds, and we really liked to talk about video games and comics, and we found it, bonded really well because of this, you know, became good friends, yada, 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 that doesn't matter. Naturally, as any friends do, we want to stick together, get the same classes, that sort of thing. So some people started poking, poking fun at it, saying that I was into Samantha, but honestly, I wasn't thinking about it then. I just, you know, wanted to have fun. I had a best friend. That's all that mattered. Like, I was in a foreign country. I didn't want to think too hard about this sort of stuff. At least that's what I thought before seventh grade rolled around. See, everybody remembers their seventh grade year. Or maybe it's their eighth. I don't know, I can't predict for any of you. It's that time when hormones start kicking and the person next to you starts to look a little cuter than before. Uh, love is in the air. And even though I was a fat ass motherfucker like I am now, I still felt the same way my skinny friends felt, which was that some of the, some of the girls in our class was something kind of, kind of cute. Uh, of course, we were seventh graders and that was all we did. We didn't do anything else with that. And then, Eighth grade comes around, let me tell you, eighth grade is an entirely different beast. Because for starters, most of the guys actually have balls now to get girls' attention. And so our couples for me and our, my guy friends, who are also fellow nerds, please stop judging me, got a little jealous. And I mean, who wouldn't? So out of this group of friends, one guy suggests the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard about. What if we just like get all the girls that we know so far and just ask them out? He said it'd be easy since... You know, we already knew each other and we had nothing to lose, which, by the way, dude, there's so much we can lose. There's so much at stake here. Middle school social life, it's a lot more important than you think. But, of course, us being either incredibly stupid or daring, we decided to set out to devise a plan so that we can all do this at the same time, like some sort of weird suicide pact, but it's social suicide. Um, but unfortunately, this had a slight drawback because someone leaked this info to the girls, and that someone was me, because I'm stupid, I do a lot of dumb things in my life, like right now, me telling you guys this, all this information. Um, but looking back at it, I think I leaked it because I was absolutely horrible at keeping secrets, wanted to gossip like there was no tomorrow. But I also think that it might have been because I didn't believe we had a chance. And my friends just gave up having to do anything about asking people out, you know. But, you know, stupid little me has a little voice in his head that goes, Hey, why don't you ask Samantha? She's kind of cute and you're friends and nothing bad can happen about that. So, you know, me with my two whole brain cells was like, I'm going to ask her out in the middle of the hallway between classes where there's like basically no way to actually listen to what anybody was telling me. So it's on a Friday. It's right after history class. Mr. McCarthy's class, I love that man, I miss him, man, but that doesn't, that's not the main focus. We're, we were transitioning to our next class, which meant that there's about, like, since we had about 200, 300 kids in that school, that was about, like, 100, 150 kids, really rowdy kids, trying to push each other and get to their classes all at the same time. So, me being the genius I am, I exit the door, tap Samantha in the, on the back, and ask her if she wants to go out, and... At first, she, didn't, she couldn't respond because she didn't, couldn't hear what I was saying, because so nobody could. So I had to ask it a couple times, and it was three times in a row. By then, I was con actually considering suicide. But um, <laughs> once she did understand what I said, she gave me a neutral look and then kind of walked away. <clears throat> so then, uh, anyway, after about a week, she goes and says yes. And 
it was, how do I put it, like, um, oh my fucking god, holy shit, that is amazing, I thought this shit happened before, because I didn't think this happened, like, what? Something like that, but, so, I promise you, people around me were absolutely thrilled, was I, as was I, and in a matter of days, for some reason, this got me up the social hierarchy, because you see a fat kid, you know, somehow succeeding anywhere in life, I guess that warrants a whole celebra celebration like right now, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, you know, moved up the social hierarchy, that was great. So one day I was some nameless Asian kid who talked way too much about video games, about, about personal things like I'm doing right now. And, but this had somehow gotten me to the rank of social prodigy. I gained all these new friends who I never thought I would imagine giving any moment out of the schedules to talk to me like this. Like this dude named Paul from the football team who was a big one. He was a big guy. I was still kind of scared of him, but he, 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 he treated me cool. I can't forget that. But partially that was only because of this relationship. And, you know, since this middle school social life resembled something out of high school musical, that meant that I was in contact with these jocks and some other more popular people for a while. And so we dated for about four months. It was arguably the, high, the highlight of my life, and I bet if my life got turned into a three-minute montage, which, considering the state of the world right now and the inevitability of World War III and me getting trapped in the army because I didn't get into any colleges, yeah, it's gonna be about three minutes. Um, but in that three-minute montage, at least two minutes would be holed up like this, because things don't get really any better than this. So now, since we're in middle school, we didn't really do anything with this. Um, I was a boarding student, she was a day student. We didn't actually, we couldn't go on dates or anything, but we made it our mission in classes to hold hands and do other cutesy, stupid, colored shit. Which, I mean, a lot, looking back at it now was really stupid, but you know, you know, honestly, we were the cute, awkward couple in the corner, you know? One really fat kid and one hot girl trying to clumsily figure out what love meant, so. Whatever, that's way too much detail. I need to finish the story before I go back to my bed sobbing. Um, so remember how I said I remember how I said I do a lot of stupid shit in my life. Um, yeah, well here it comes, I dumped her. <laughs> the thing is, this is all middle school. Why should I care? I'm going to college, or maybe not. I might. The thing is, being on top of that social hierarchy brings with it a certain high. Um, I've never done drugs or anything like that before, so I don't know what that really means, but I never. You get so overwhelmed with the constant attention and the pressure from others and with your actions, and you know, that things start getting fueled by emotion, not by logic or pre existing knowledge or common sense. It's the same factor that pushes stupid people to do stupid things. Like, Staying dumb shit like I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm such a stupid person. <laughs> but in the heat of the moment, you know, I, I lost track of my thing. That's how, that's how emotional this is. But, you know, of course, that's only half of the picture. You know, you know I'm trying to sell you on an idea. I'm trying to make this sound like as if I'm the, you know, I'm persuaded by emotions. But part of it was also just, for lack of better words, bored, boredom. I know that was. Uh, a uh, very assholey thing to say, and that's kind of why I'm saying, that's kind of why I'm bringing this up. I felt as though, at least at the time, that the anticipation, the adrenaline rush of being in the early stages of a relationship, that honeymoon period, that's what people talk about, was much more desirable than staying in a long-term one. And there was also the fact that my original group of friends no longer talked to me on a daily basis, and for whatever reason, I thought that trade-off was okay up until now, and then now I'm changing my mind, and there's a whole lot of different emotions going in my head, and everything's going haywire, and so for whatever reason, I was like, I foolishly believed that breaking up with Samantha would help with this. So just like how I suddenly asked her out in the middle of nowhere, I suddenly broke up with her in the middle of nowhere. Uh, she was at my basketball game. Um, it was a bench one, and I walked off the bench, walked up halfway across the court without anybody's permission, and she's understandably confused that what I was doing, and I asked her to, to break up. And you know, young Einstein here thought that that's all you needed to end relationships. You just, you know, walk out and press accept, walk out, press confirm, deny, that sort of thing. Um, predicted Tinder in a couple of years, but. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's it. I just left on the spot. Nothing else really happens after that. There's no punchline in this story. Nothing really funny happened. There's no grand co con conclusion. I stopped talking to a lot of people. Never got any of my friends back. All the rewards I reaped in that year ended up becoming nothing and was really meaningless when you look at it. Um, and yeah, all I remember was I never talked to anybody in the year after that. Then I graduated. That was it. That was my grand illustrious adventure in the land of love. And I don't think I want to go back there anytime soon, at least for now. Do I have any regrets about what I did? No. No, sir. No, I'm not, I'm not regretting right now. I'm not regretting. I'm not regretting. <laughs>